Welcome to Policy on Demand. I'm Janice Mays. In the fall of 2022, the SEC finalized two rules that were required by the Dodd-Frank Act. And those rules were to improve executive compensation transparency and accountability. Joining me today to delve into what they mean for public companies are Chris Hamilton and Matt DiGiuseppe. Chris and Matt, welcome to the show today. Yeah, thank you for having us. Great to be here today, Janice. Let's start right in with it. So Chris, we're gonna talk about the first rule and it's called pay for performance. And as I understand it, it requires the disclosure of executive compensation that's paid by a company relative to the company's financial performance. Can you talk about the significance of the rule and about this requirement and what information does have to be disclosed? Sure, why don't we first start about the why? We had the financial crisis about 13, 14, 15 years ago, gave rise to the Dodd-Frank Act, which uh, is trying to uh, remedy some perceived and perhaps actual abuses in the executive compensation world. So the act uh, is requiring companies to now disclose uh, pay versus performance. There are, are rules out now about deferred compensation and another rule that we'll talk about in terms of clawbacks. So they're trying to um, address perceived and actual abuses that happen in the executive compensation world. Now, in terms of significance, uh, the SEC wants companies to explicitly demonstrate the relationship between pay and performance uh, via quantitative comparisons and visual illustrations. And uh, while companies have tried to do that uh, via their cDNA uh, with a little bit of text, it's probably perceived as a little uh, inadequate. So they're requiring uh, specific demonstrations of the pay versus performance. Public companies now are required to uh, put this disclosure in the back, kind of behind a cDNA. And the disclosure is showing that there is a table within the disclosure that shows the summary comp table, total pay for the CEO and the average of the other NEOs, compares that to something called compensation actually paid, which I'll get to in a second, along with total shareholder return, both for the company and a peer group, which often is an index, gap net income, and a company selected measure. Now, compensation actually paid is essentially actual salary, actual bonus paid, and then the fair value uh, of the equity awards granted. And um, for this initial year, it was uh, going back three years. And after the first year, you're basically showing a change in fair value from year to year. Matt, the new disclosure was required in 2023 proxies for the most of the public companies. How did shareholders react to that? Did they care about the new information? And what can we expect going forward? Yeah, so it's interesting. As Chris alluded to, the rule really sort of came on pretty quickly in terms of company compliance. And 2023 was the first year it was in the proxy. And I'd really describe it as sort of the discovery year, if you will. Right. When you think about shareholders developing their voting guidelines and policies that happen sort of in this actual time of year, right, the, the winter period. And at that time, they had not seen any of these disclosures. So you can't really write a policy on something that you haven't seen. When I talked to my former peers, I'm a recovering shareholder, by the way, they said that, you know, really what they were looking for in year one was discrepancies between, you know, the, the most important compensation metrics in the new disclosure versus what's in the actual um, proxy. And, you know, even when I think back to when I was wearing that shareholder hat, I used probably four definitions of compensation and maybe five different peer groups trying to suss out this idea of pay for performance. And this is another data point. But going forward, I think it does provide you know, an opportunity for an additional insights. We're watching closely to see how shareholders will amend their policies for the 2024 proxy season. We already have seen amended guidelines from Glass Lewis, who's a prominent mm -hmm. proxy advisor. They've said that, well, they're still gonna use their their actual pay for performance scoring methodology, 
the information in this table can actually be a mitigating factor if a company has scored sort of D or F, the two lowest grades that, that they provide. So I think we're gonna slowly see more and more use of this information as investors have more information and more time to interpret it. I'll just pause with one sort of last thing. There are, there are other people that are looking at this table. Um, notably, there were a few SEC comment letters on the topic because the disclosure, as Chris said, is so complicated. The technical actually does matter and, and people are paying attention to that as well. Chris, we're gonna to move to the second rule now. That's known as the clawback rule. And I'm gonna to try to get this right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my cards here. It requires public companies to establish and enforce policies to recover excess incentive compensation from executive officers if amounts are based on material misstatements in financial reports. Which executive officers are covered? How's this calculated, this clawback rule? And what needs to be disclosed? Sure, so the uh, SEC re rule requires that uh, executive officers um, are included in the clawback. Uh, and this is as of December 1st. And um, it's all Section 16 executives under uh, Rule 10D-1. Now, I'm going to look down at my card because I want to make sure I say this correctly. So the pre-tax amount that can be clawed back by the organization is the incentive-based compensation paid or vested that exceeds the amount of incentive-based compensation that would have been paid or vested to the executive had it been determined based on restated financials. So where compensation is based on a stock price or total shareholder return, the company needs to make a reasonable estimate of the impact of the restatement. So I, I wanna make sure that I say that correctly because it's essentially like the excess amount when you then factor in the restatement. Now the look back period is three years and companies may not offer to indemnify uh, any of the executives, which is an important thing. Uh, in terms of disclosure, the callback policy must be uh, disclosed as an exhibit to the issuer's annual 10K. And if the uh, issuer executes a callback, it must report it in its proxy the date required to prepare the accounting restatement, the aggregate callback amount, and uh, the analysis of the amount that was uh, calculated, um, and, and also amounts that are unrecovered, which probably won't happen too often, but it could. Um, there will also be on the, the front of the 10K some check boxes that the issuer will have to check. All right, let's talk about this rule a bit about. <laughs> you know, Chris said it is effective December 1. Mm -hmm. So public companies have to have this policy adopted mm -hmm. by that point. So what should companies consider as they're putting these rules in? Do they need to do anything more than just conform with the actual statute words? Yeah, that's actually the a great, that's a great words. point because there's the actual statute words and, and that is one form of clawback that deals with misstatements and errors. Chris and I were actually moderating um, a discussion with about 15 board directors two weeks ago. And I'd say what, 70% of our conversation was focused on this yep. topic. Because what directors are, are struggling with is not just sort of the technical policy that they need to put in place for compliance, but understanding sort of what they're trying to achieve with their clawback. Um, as we sort of said at the top, this rule comes 13 years after Dodd-Frank introduced this idea that it was going to be mandatory. And this is one area where companies actually got in front of the SEC and have been adopting clawback policies um, based on pressures from the, the shareholder community. And those sort of focus on two distinct ideas. One is when there was wrongdoing by an executive that led to a misstatement, right? Intentional malice. And then the other was when there was reputational harm that was caused to the company, which isn't a restatement, but can actually have a more significant financial impact. And so boards are now trying to square the concept of we have to do the SEC required clawback for a certain section, set of officers, but do we want to include that reputational harm element and have a second policy, or do we want to expand the number of employees that could be subject to the clawback? And so that's really where they're spending their time. You know, you can work with your legal um, advisors and, and adopt a policy that that very much fits the letter of the rule. But as a board, we see them thinking about how do we actually want to and use clawbacks as a mechanism in our executive compensation program rather than sort of just looking at the letter of the law. I think it's great that business is thinking more broadly here. Yes.
Well, Chris and Matt, thank you so much for sharing your insights on these important new rules. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.